Only other game that I have a difficult relationship is Deadly Premonition 2. Uh, in that, despite enjoying it, events and contents post-playing resulted in severe negative reflections upon further review. I actually wrote a ton of stuff about it too. My theories and opinions on Swery as an artist, how I think he works best and worst, and how shit ended up all problematic this way, but I, I don't think I want to bog down this video with that. <sighs> well, here we go, I guess. I think I'm very good at knowing my own tastes. You might say that that sounds like a weird flex or like, well, duh, but I don't know. I see people being disappointed by things all over the place and that pretty much never happens to me. I must say that's because my tastes can be very surface level. Music and visuals. Things I can gauge from images and gameplay videos, so if I see and hear those things in images or videos and they are to my liking, then I have been guaranteed to get something out of that game. And generally, the other aspects won't be able to taint that. I don't care about performance or janky mechanics or disappointing endings or whatever the hell else people get hung up about. I got out of it what I knew I would get out of it based on what I knew the game to have prior to playing. The only thing that can sometimes chuck a wee wrench is pacing. Might be because I value that a lot myself. Like, these videos, dog, they're paced pretty hecking good, you gotta admit. So then, when Deadly Premonition 2 hit me with transphobia and racism, as well as a hefty falling out on Twitter as a result, I absolutely did not see that coming. So blindsided by the trust in my own carefree approach to liking things that I wasn't sure I knew quite how to even parse it. For my review at the time, I rewrote what I wrote about this about a dozen times as I slowly came to realize how much deeper this all went than simple debt naming and some accents. All the while Sweary was slowly exploding in my periphery at his own fanbase, which got me to scrap all I what I'd written, going with a, look, it's in there, I don't know. And putting a lot of my, not frustrations, but defo like, complicated yet still strong non-specific emotions into what I said about not minding the performance and coming off way too strong on that front as a result. This then sort of tainted the reception to said video too, <laughs> at least in my experience, all coinciding into me actually ending up despising Swery and the game that he made for quite a long time after that video came out, thus not even bothering, touching, mentioning, or watching any content on the good life. Luckily, having had more than a few years to ponder over all of it since, I think I've ended up on a very good theory and anal cis as to why and how it ended up as it were. As you see, in my opinion, Swery has a, and I don't mean this meanly or mockingly, very childlike view of the world when he expresses it creatively. And with basic concepts like spy fiction or just a wee murder mystery, this works. But when he tries to tackle complicated issues with many sides and facets, it can fall flat on its ass. Often resorting to standard issue conventions or sweeping good versus evil ideas and otherwise historically safer bets. For example, the original Deadly Prem is problematic, but it's also very tropes. Shit doesn't have to be indicative of dick all about sweary, but more so just the culture and time frame that produced both that game and certainly its influences. Evil deviants, pure blonde maidens who have been corrupted by vices, twisted abuse victims, and similar fuck shits as such. All tropes used very bigly in Elden Cinema, so I don't think you can put that on sweary when taken on its own. But when you then add DP2 to that, it's suddenly like, why is your cast of villains a black man, a obese woman, and a trans woman, a abuse victim, and even a gay man or a very, very bad depiction of another trans woman? And why is your hero this cop-ass government man? This dude who seems to almost look down upon everyone, having to teach these hick bastards about right and wrong, lecturing the black guy on prejudice, and maybe having a creepo moment at the child in the end? I'm I'm actually not sure how to read that. Not to mention how deeply fucked Deadly Premonition 2 is thematically at its core as well, as its cast is ostensibly treated like dirt. More. I want more. I mean, 
this is probably not how I'd depict a minor moaning and half naked. I'd also not go down the path it does with mental disabilities and how it treats its voodoo like themes also comes across as racist to me and it sure as shit is a choice to make the villain a drug dealing trans lady who also does incest which uh, I mean that, that last bit really did not need to be there. It only and I'm going to assume unknowingly on Swery's part plays into those gross conservative trans people are predators slash sex pervert ideas and well you could argue that these are stories to be told and things that happen. I'd argue that within the context of the game's moral compass seeming shaky with the proud slave owner descendant transphobe dad getting an honorable emotional death scene and York constantly dead naming his daughter in his honor after her death and who and what as such it chooses to vilify and why overall across both games it does. Uh, when I stopped seeing these things as simply tropes, it began to paint a very fucky picture of Swery and his worldviews in my head, being that so much of what York says or what his games convey seems to be an allegusi to what Swery thinks. However, here one might be inclined to be like, but the missing though. To which I will say, A, he had hella help in writing that from queer consultants so it doesn't count, nor was it particularly galaxy brain levels of profound or deep despite how it may have vibed with some eggs and baby queers as a more formative piece for them, which is cool even if it still had a bit of clunk to it. And B, I have it on good authority that he pretty directly refused their help on DP2 even when it was offered. Now, Granted, there is a bit of behind the scenes messiness here revolving around the walking allegation that is Matt Kahn and his involvement in DP2 and how it relates to the missing too, with Swery sadly still being buds with him, but uh, that's not really my business to make public, as the public version is that Swery simply cited that he knew what to do now. Same way he was ranting on Twitter about walking his own way. <laughs> On that same token though, he's also very vocal about not wanting to hurt anyone's feelings and about his beliefs that queer folks shouldn't be judged or treated differently for who they are, which York also manages to mouthpiece a fair bit in game and I'd like to think that that's more representative of Swery's heart regardless of whatever's going on in his brain. Plus, he was genuinely very hurt by the feedback to Deadly Premonition 2, creating the idea to me that he defo didn't know what he did was gonna come across to as many as it did. Nor do I think that a hostile reaction towards a Twitter mob is an ununderstandable one either. That shit stops being constructive criticism and becomes mere white noise if the quantity is harsh enough, which for him I'ma say it hella was. It's hard to see things from someone's perspective when your perspective is thousands of faceless angry Twitter PFPs all yelling the same shit. If you don't have an audience, you cannot and should not even attempt to judge what it's like psychologically to feel your own audience turning against you, however validly that may have been at the jump. Either way though, uh, no, I, I don't think Swery has shitty views, or if he does, he certainly doesn't want to have them, he might just not be fully aware that they can come across as shitty. Regardless, he certainly did express shitty views in DP2s by virtue of child braining complicated situations mixed with relying on tropey 80s and 90s Hollywood movie influences, possibly interpreted through a smidge of loss in translation as well, and trying to bite off more than he can chew as such a good idea. I didn't ask for your personal opinion, Melvin. Especially if it comes from an antiquated, xenophobic way of thinking that's characteristic of rural towns. That statement came after the reveal that the character he's talking to, the sheriff, who's himself the target of frequent racism, is indeed transphobic. But the way that York says that is pretty dang problematic and mean in and of itself, playing right into the notion that someone from a small rural town has to be some dumb ignorant hick motherfucker, as if that's just how they all are, and it also ignorantly implies that someone from the big city from 2005, 2000 fucking 5, is automatically progressive enough to have base takes on trans people. York even so much as states that outright earlier, which I'm going to say is not true. Was not true and still sadly is rarely true, especially not for a hacking FBI agent. All of which tell me that while well-meaning, Swery also just straight up had no idea what the fuck he was talking about. Melvin, you're careless in every sense of the word, but I believe you operate on the side of good in most cases. With that in mind, I'm disappointed to see that you carry some prejudice with you.
Yeah, that's probably a sentiment I can echo right back at him. And then, once again, when that then gets combined with him dealing with the fallout shittily on Twitter and people dealing with him, dealing with it shittily in a shittily way too, it can be very easy to look at the entire situation and say, fuck this and fuck this guy. Which led me to where I was. Being that I did not remember DP2 fondly, even though I enjoyed it, I had grown to hate my own video on it. I barely even wanted to think of the first game anymore, despite that previously being one of my all-time favorite games. And I did not wish to play The Good Life. Hey, more like so I've not been playing. Damn. Almost seemed like that was building up to some kind of review, wasn't it? Maybe at some point it was. Cause welcome to So I've Been Playing, the show where I talk about games and experiences I have experienced that I wasn't able to make fully fledged videos out of or repurpose otherwise. Or at least that's what it was over the course of 2022 and that's what this is too. A holdover from that year that I wrote then and revised a ton but wasn't ever sure what to do with. Which uh, yeah, that's <laughs> a little bit where I'm at with So I've Been Playing in general. Started off as a fun way to cover whatever for any reason but slowly morphed into a bit of a new releases dumping ground which was not what I wanted. I also got bored of the thumbnail template after the second one so I'm defo dropping that and otherwise I'll probably only use these more so now as truly random ass whatever videos as I really only want to focus on the things I truly want to focus on from here on out for the time being. As as I spoke about in the game awards video at the end of last year I'm not a fan of the compiling videos to bloating headspace I got into over the course of it. This video the video originally was going to be that sweary rant and then it would continue on into me leading into reviewing Trotmobili Oh uh, yeah, Steambot Chronicles Così come le automobili sono diventate sempre pi Only because I wrote that incredible joke that you saw just now and because it could be compared to the good life fairly easily too due to it having a similar structure but not because I particularly wanted to play it or had any real reason in covering it yet. Back then I defo woulda but now, no, fuck y'all. I ain't doing shit I don't want to do. Though, uh, on the real, thanks for donating though. Besides, a better call might be to actually focus on some sweary shits a bit more, as I did actually end up playing The Good Life and thought it was really cute. Given the prems, it should not come as a surprise that the town is fucking adorable. Perfect music, perfect sunshine, perfect characters, shops, buildings, cats, and the decrease in scale helped it look a whole lot less penisy than what preceded it. Though it wouldn't be a double A 3D game without at least some PS360 skunk to go around, hence the shiny table reminiscent of the shiny 360 and the shiny grass and the shiny road and the shiny gate and of course the shiny wood I uh, I also caught these Brits red-handed they call them chips anyway in secret sneaky motherfuckers one moment they ask you to take pictures of a scarecrow and the next they turn into a fucking dog but I quite enjoy just being here exploring and doing wee side quests from time to time and mainly just vibing and chatting loving the sound effect work or the cozy winding paths and the happy attitude of the cast it's basically all the charm of a deadly premonition but with none of the baggage though also none of the spectacle spooks in action lest you count rats it is a non-violent game which I dig and would like to see more more of in general, but <laughs> I also can't help but feel that perhaps not the most creative alternatives were thought of as it do be fetch quests the game. I don't mind that on principle and while I'm cool with what it expects you to get or how much of it, it certainly makes sure you will always have to take the longest route possible to get there. Both physically but also requirementally with shit like money getting involved and personal uptake and date and time and all of the odd jobby things that involve maintaining those that take place in between. Uh, I certainly wasn't ever bored, I'll say that much. Sheep riding, rain breezing, as if a cute combo between the skating and window wiper storming of the premonition's past. It's just that I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't also cursing the good life out loud a few times. Classic moments like traveling for ages to get to a place only to find that you needed a thing that the quest marker never mentioned needing. To be fair, it is very clearly a budget title, but there's making a small game small and making a small game 
spread thin and the story ain't exactly thick, girthy, or dumpy in any capacity neither, boasting a plethoroid of non-voiced side questy cutscenes for all the main questy bits. Still, for what it is, either way, I did mostly enjoy it. I love how every day feels a little different, flourishing with subtle weather changes and shifts in floral fauna and the schedules of those about town, and how you slowly get to know them and their hidden or obvious eccentricities, and how this gradually unfurls into a very fairy tale esque JRPG adventure gamey whimsy that suits the setting to a T. So one moment you're infiltrating a castle ball in fancy dress only to sneak into the cellar to steal hella whiskey and become the drink queen, and the next you're climbing a mountain in a snowstorm and exploring a spooky mine in first person. It certainly did do a great job to create a living, breathing map with more than enough detail and visual variety to go around. And hey, at the very least, it didn't post problematic cringe. That could be because it had three additional writers and two co-directors with Swery's focus perhaps being on Deadly Premonition 2, but I still needed that in some way. It's just nice to be able to enjoy the good life and not have Swery's taint leering at me from the rearview mirror. So I also went back to both DPs. I needed that footage after all, and to establish and confirm how I feel about either more prominently. <coughs> Two still very much hitting me the same way, to be honest. I continue to love its warm, comfy, colorful, sunny town and the overall aesthetics with the great use of color, lighting, tree root infused body horror and dripped out beads and gold heavy ornamentations. As well as the bright beautiful skyboxes and the amazing fava bean green penis trees. I also think that its characters are mostly fun if a bit flatter and I still don't give a shit about performance and I do find the gameplay maybe a tad too slow at times, if thematically holiday -ian. Only thing really that's changed for me is that I find its themes to be even grosser now with a clearer view of where they're going on a second run. Should note though that I do believe there to be some type of deliberate thematic intent there. Having this happy go fucky top layer to life and all this ugly twisted shit going underneath with that corrupting the good. These are themes borrowed from Twin Peaks and I think when you look at it like that it does begin to make easy sense how it can both be like respect trans people. Trans people are cool. Some of my best friends are trans. And also be like, okay, but if trans people are cool, then also one of them should be evil and corrupted and do incest and deal drugs and kill. It's very much a theme the The Gut Life runs with too, only it does so, so much better in my opinion, simply by going down the route of whimsy of cats and dogs at night and maybe a little murder, but nothing too crazy far as underbellies go. Oh, I'd argue the OG DP, while similar to its sequel, has much more clarity on what it deems bad or good, unmuddied by ham-fisted, well-meaning but woefully clunkily written grandstanding about racism, sexism, and transphobia just as well. Cause, dog, I still love this janky mess of a game. The lighting, the coloring, the texture choices, just the way that everything sounds and the genuinely really strong directing during the cutscenes this game pisses personality. It's easy to be like, Lamau, Twin Peaks, but as two shows, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to capture and still so much of its own thing too. From the beyond inspired choice to open up this bitch on Tom and Jerry discourse followed by monkey chipmunks. To the flowery characterization and writing that led to the prior. Pacing can be a little long-winded here as well, and technically it's held together by duct tape, but it's such a warm, comfy blanket of a game all the same. The child-brained writing while creating a few oof-worthy themages is also exactly what gives one such overwhelming charm on most other fronts. Besides, it so badly makes me want to make a game myself, partially because I can see all the cogwheels churning away behind the scenes through the cracks in the jank and the transparently gamey level design. So yeah, this one for sure is still one of my all-time favorite games of all time. Good job, Swery. Yes, your doctor told us that you air to be our patient 
accept our enthusiastic congratulations and well wish on your coming event. And we assured that we have a very personal interest in your case and have already taken steps to see to T that your stay in the Paulo Alto Hospital will be may us a social visit before you enter. We want to mend and greet you for yours. Oh my god. <laughs> what does get me about this game's more iffy elements is how well humanized the cast is. George is a multifaceted guy who has suffered hella abuse at the hands of his own mother but has seemed to be able to rise above that. To want to try and do something about the abuse of power in his own small way by protecting the town that he grew up in and the people within it that he cares for. And thus, throughout all the legit well-written dialogue and its many deep convos you can have with him about this, it does kinda sting to have the core twist be, <laughs> but he did not rise above his abuse. In fact, his abuse made him evil after all. Making him the guy who's secretly been killing bitches in very fetish-coded ways as if that is also part of the bad. Which. Again, one, those are movie tropes, and I am inclined to think that the former is more so what Swery would like to convey, with the latter being him just rolling with his movie influences, and again, two, likely done up with a bit of loss in translation, thus maybe not fully grasping how at odds the two to the one is. Sadly, it is exactly that two that makes two a little tougher to go back to for one because there's almost none of the latter one into and much more of the former two. You don't get to know Lena. You talk to her once when she reveals that her family was transphobic and had her live a life of shit and therefore now they must die. I think that's valid, but the game paints this as bad and so you shoot her shirtless and spend the rest of it dead naming her fucking corpse. And I think that sucks. It is a story to tell, but <laughs> not by sweary and not like this. Though, uh, yeah, I, I set my piece. I do like all of these games more than I don't. Even do. And just as well, there's no point in crying over taint milk. The sweary milk.